Shelley Carney and Toby Eunice bring you New Mexico Day Trips. Visit national parks, monuments, state parks, and historical sites. See the amazing and unique desert vistas of the land of enchantment and walk through the visitor centers, museums, and Pueblo ruins with us. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and flavors of New Mexico. Let's have an adventure. Hello, and welcome to New Mexico Day Trips. I'm Shelly Carney. I think you're fine. Can you, can you hear me? No. You know what I think it is? I think no. it's that you cannot. How's no, it? I hear you. Yeah. yeah. It's that music. I need to turn that music down. Yeah. It's high. It's loud. And, and it wipes out everything else. Uh, why don't you say, did you say hi? Yeah. Did you introduce yourself? Yeah. I'm Toby Eunice. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to be talking about the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Da -da -da. They have a lot of dinosaurs there. Buku dinosaurs. Buku. And uh, it's a cool place to visit. It's a, it's, it's a very popular museum. There's a lot of people there, a lot of school field trips, a lot of families. People get family passes, and they go frequently if, they're, if they live close to it. You know, it's, There's a lot of stuff to do and see in there, so... Um, here's my estimate busy, my busy. estimate is if you don't include whatever the special things are like they have this thing right now on chocolate you could spend a day in the chocolate one it's a three day museum if you really want to do it right you can do a lot of passing go in and get the book at the end well not necessarily get the book um, so that's the first bit of advice the second bit of advice is Get the map as soon as you walk in the door and before you do anything else, stop one of the docents and say, could you please explain this to me? Because you're going to find in our video, we went literally backwards because that's the logic. You start on the bottom floor and you go up new. You start on the top floor and you go down. And it kind of spirals around. It, yeah. You, you yeah. Don't, if you don't know that, then you end up going backwards. So, <laughs> And then you're like, what? oh, there's a, some, a sign How there. Did, what happened there? We go like, what happened? No, not there. Oh. I'm talking about, oh, I'm yeah. doing an imitation of how we were at the. Yeah. So read the blog post if you want to know more about how we went backwards. Yeah. Blog post. <laughs> All right. Let me make some announcements, do some stuff like that first. Um, let me take care of some business. First of all, we would appreciate it if you, before you leave tonight, you like our video, YouTube likes it when you like our video, share it with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your business associates, the entirety of your social media network so that we can grow the channel. Finally, if you're not already a subscriber, this would be the ideal time to subscribe. And uh, if you click on the notifications bell every time we uh, start a live stream, you'll be immediately informed. And as a result, in the know, because there's nothing better in life rawr, than rawr. being in the know, rawr, rawr, <laughs> blue swirly thing. Okay, then I got some other that's stuff. Tomorrow. Then. Oh, yeah, that's right. So Tonight's I got some other stuff rawr, rawr. Bes besides that. I've got, uh, let me share some things with you. So screen uh, share. Uh, Present. Present. Oh, uh, yeah, over there. Present. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got it over here. Okay. All right. There it is. Uh, let me turn this off for just a second. Nope, not that one. This one. Okay. So this is our blog. You can find this blog if you go to nmdaytrips.com. I'm, I'm sorry, it's our website. Uh, but the important thing about our website is that it does have a blog. And if you haven't read any of Shelley's recent posts, you should go because they're all really very informative. Shelley is a great writer. And uh, it's worth reading. I read everything that Shelley writes, even though I know the topic that she's going to be uh, writing about. He wants to make sure if I'm saying things about him that, that, that he's okay with that. Well, yeah, <laughs> most of the, there are times where she doesn't say things that I would say, like if I was uh, self centered, if I was narcissistic, but she does it in such a nice way and a funny way, like you can't help but love it. So, love it. so not only will you find the blog Shelly writes on all our day trips and more, actually, you'll find all our photo al al albums all our photo albums from our different trips. You can go there. 
We're starting to add things. Well, if you want to contact us, of course, you can do that. But we're starting to add garage prospecting to that as well. So uh, there's going to be more. She's write, starting to write blogs on that, which is very cool. Uh, and there's the GP blog, like calling it GP blog. Striking gold with pager prospecting, the modern twist on treasure hunting. Um, so it can be a profitable hobby. But anyway, nmdaytrips.com. You can get all that information there. Okay. So um, I wanted to let you know that we're doing something really different tonight. We're not going to show you a video tonight. We're going to show you photos. And we're going to talk about those photos as we walk through. And, and we took the photos after we realized the mistake that we had made. We actually took the photos in the right order. Uh, and I'll explain to you in a minute uh, what the right order is mm -hmm. or what the right order represents. Uh, but... At 7 o'clock, this video went up. I have included that video in the description box below. I guess I could give it to you again now in the chat room. Hang on. Go to the chat. Ta -ta. So if you want to watch the New Mexico Nat uh, Museum of Natural History and Science, there's the video. You're not going to see it here with us tonight. And that it's not... I don't mean to say that in a kind of offensive way. We just decided to do something different. And I think this is how we're going to do it from now on. We're going to do a presentation with our photos, and then we're going to put up the video separately. So the video, as you can see, is about an hour and 12 minutes long. You're welcome and to go to it. you must watch it because you'll get to see the animatronic dinosaur in the video. Yeah, exactly. You don't get to see it in the pictures. Rawr, rawr. So it's, uh, it's very kids cool. Are going, ah! And in addition to that, <laughs> although you're only going to see around, I don't know, 50 of the videos tonight. Videos? I'm sorry. Photos. photos. Yeah, about 50. Yeah. Uh, if you want to see the full album, I have put that link in there. I put it in this the description is the box. This full album here. Yeah, that's the what I'm saying. The story of is the one that we're sharing tonight. Right, right? that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, which reminds me, I need to have that one up. Yes. Okay, hang on. Let me give them this first. Copy link, copy. And that's the full photo album that has, I don't know, it was like 250 pictures. And if you're ever lost and can't find the photo album link, just go to our website and click on photo albums and then which one that you want, and it'll take you right to it. So we're looking There's for the story. The story that of. Okay. Yeah. So this is the ones reduced. That's Bella, uh, the Beastie Beast. Yep that we're, we're going to talk about. So that's what we're doing tonight. Tonight, we're just going to show you, we're going to talk about our photos. And uh, if you want to watch the full one hour and five minute long video, the link is now in the chat room. And if you're not in the chat room now, you can go to the description box below and it's there as well. All right. The last thing I wanted to share with you here is tomorrow night we are doing garage prospecting and we're going to we're going to be introducing a video on uh, prospecting uh, the well garage prospecting the beach miner pay dirt from uh, from a Bering Sea pay dirt. For those of you that are familiar with Bering Sea Gold, there's a woman on there whose name is Emily Rydell. She's been on there since the first season, I think. Uh, but she's their longest running uh, person on the show. Uh, she's married and they recently had their first baby, baby Evie. But they've been packaging uh, pay dirt from the area. This is their beach miner pay dirt, which is collected from a, a dredge that works the beach. Because in Nome, you can literally work the beach for gold. You don't have to go out and dive off of Nome like they do. Uh, but I ordered a bag of their pay dirt, their beach uh, mining pay dirt. It supposedly has a half gram of real Bering Sea gold guaranteed, which is nice to have a guarantee with that. We'll be processing that tomorrow night on um, Garage Prospecting. And they so sent you stickers when you got there. Yeah, they sent us some very cool stickers. So yeah. I haven't figured out what to do with it. I think I'm going to put them on the outside of our wash plant. Hmm, that's what a good that? idea. Good idea. If they stick. Sometimes if there's a texture, they don't stick very well. Well, the wash plant is uh, that plastic container, the bin. Oh, yeah, yeah the bin. So it should uh, it should stick on there, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. Makes all sense. Right. Okay. I think that's all the announcements I have for tonight. All right. Well, let's take a look. at. Did we buy anything other than this? Shirt? Yeah, we did. So um, we bought a couple of things. You number one. Full screen on us there? Um, number one. Once you leave there, you realize that uh, the 
story of this location, like all of us, I, I think this happens to Shelly and I all the time. So this is the map that is representative. Now there is a photo of the map and what we're going to show you tonight. Um, but it starts up here on the second floor with number one. And you don't realize that until you've actually gotten to that section. You go like, ah, we just went backwards. Then that was my fault for not paying attention to the big numbers that exp that you're supposed to be reading if we had looked at the map first. Thankfully, we ran into a docent whose name was Tom, and he was not only helpful for getting us on the right track, we kept bumping into him. And so he, we'd update each other as, our progress, as we were making progress. Real good guy. People thought, well, I'll get to that later. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the second Tell thing I did yet. is, so part of the story that we want to tell you tonight is, uh, about this museum. It's called the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. And you assume that if you're going into a museum of natural history, um, it talks about natural history in the context of the existence of the world, right? What's interesting about this is although it starts its story back in origins, you're going to see a picture of that, you know, four and a half billion years ago when the earth was first. No, it's 12 billion. No, no, no. That's the universe is 13 billion. The Earth is four and a half billion. Mm. Okay, you say so. No, no, no. I'm not. That's <laughs> a, that's science, right? Science. Science. It's, we're doing science. We're doing science. Um, but one of the things that you discover is that it's this story, and the context for the story is New Mexico. New Mexico has we've we've always known that New Mexico has a great geological history. We knew that because of some of the places that we've been, that it had a relatively interesting paleontology, paleontological history. Got it right, finally. Paleontological. But what you discover in this museum is that entire story from 4.5 billion years ago to today can be told in the context of New Mexico. They don't have to go anyplace else to get these dinosaur bones. Everything that's in this museum, well, not everything, 85% of what's in this New Mexico is representative. In this New Mexico? In, in this museum is representative of New Mexico. That's what's cool about it. And that's Especially why. Especially in the uh, long, the permanent exhibits. Right. Maybe not as much in the traveling ones because they go around the world with those. Right. Uh, or at least around the United States. Um, but for the permanent exhibit. It's very focused on New right. Mexico. In addition to that, of course, they have a planetarium, uh, but they had two temporary, not traveling, temporary exhibits that were here for a time. And one of them was um, uh, Mars. They had a, a... Perseverance, Rover. They had Perseverance. They had Rover. They had uh, the drone. What He has a name. The helicopter. Uh, in Ingenuity. 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 Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So they had it's in the it's in the blog. <laughs> they they weren't models, they were like exact replicas. They're, they called them twins. Yeah. 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 So they had that. And then they had this really good temporary exhibit on chocolate and where it comes from and how it's made. And you know, what does chocolate have to do with New Mexico? Well, the simple fact of the matter is in Chaco Canyon as they were excavating the various locations, they found cups, uh, 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 pottery cups, um, that were used in a, uh, a spiritual exercise, a religious exercise, and down in the bottom of the cups was dried chocolate. So they started working, where, well, how they, well that's when they, they found chocolate and they found parrot feathers and uh, macaw feathers. Well, those none of, neither, uh, none of those exist in New Mexico. So that's when they concluded that they were trading with the uh, tribes in Mexico and, and Central America because they have access to chocolate and macaws and parrots, uh, which is interesting because the indication, you know, all indications were that the migration of the Native Americans into the Americas, and, and I guess you could argue, the, the original, the ancient Ameri uh, native, uh, the ancient uh, uh, Indians were from the Bering Strait down and eventually to New Mexico and to South America. Well, there's some indications that they were doing that along before. So there's new conjecture 
that maybe there was travel down the Pacific coast and that's how they got there so far before. But we were trading with them, the Chacoans, the Chacoan people, the ancient uh, tribal people uh, were trading with uh, the Mexican um, Native American, Native Mexicans. Because they love chocolate so much, they called themselves Chacos. Ch you see, now people people <laughs> trust you, right? So now Does they're going to take the Shelly said that they were called Chacos because they could, love chocolate. It's a wonderful hypothesis, but we'd like some evidence before you start sharing it oh. with Earl. Hypothetically speaking, can't we just have fun with it? We have to be exact. Yeah. Uh, you have a child storybook here. In it is hand, not a child like, storybook. Oh, oh we got to be scientific. So this is a book that Toby bought in the gift shop called The Age of Dinosaurs in New Mexico. And, and it's got pictures of all the different exhibits that are in the museum. which is In the context cool. of the age, because that's the other thing that you find out. You start four and a half billion years ago, and then you move age through age to the present. And that's what this book, I wanted this book because that's what it did. You know, it it followed the context of age to age, lattes, and um, <laughs> and reference uh, uh, New Mexico. Oh, John, uh, those videos that you sent us. By the time we got them, we couldn't. We tried to open them, and they wouldn't open. So I wanted to share them with the folks. If you can figure out how to put them, I don't know what format they are, but uh, my Windows machine wouldn't open them. So. And anyway, we, are, we got this book. Anyway, we got the book. And then and we the wanted shirt. to get and that shirt. And we wanted to get something representative and of our we time got there. Candy. Because <laughs> they were having chocolate. Uh, you know, because they had a chocolate exhibit. So they were right. selling chocolates. So we got some chocolates. Yeah. And then we got the They tea. were called alligators. Yeah. They're it's, like turtles, but they were not not as chewy as turtles. No, they were definitely not as chewy, thankfully. Yeah. Because we had done that with your Valentine's candy. So I had made this for Shelly a long, long you time. You made it? You bought it. No, I'm, well, yeah, I guess I bought it. You bought it. Yeah, that. I bought it. Yeah. I bought that for Shelly. That's an ammonite. And um, I thought, well, since, since we saw a lot of ammonites during this tour of the exhibit, I'd get a pair. So when they buy them, when, when you buy ammonites, generally speaking, they sell them in pairs because they cut them down the middle. They find them like this and then they uh, cut them in half and they polish them. So this is an ammonite, a fossilized ammonite. And I gave the other half to Shelly so that she could take to her house. They come with a little stand. Here's the story of ammonites. The, an ammonite, this now fossilized uh, ammonite, goes back to around 400 million years ago. Now, the first signs of life on the planet were around 500 million years ago, beginning with single cell bacteria and then single cell uh, protozoa, et cetera, et cetera. These go back 400 million years and they survived four of the five mass extinctions from, from 500 million years ago to 65 million years ago. They survived 335 million years. And they were killed off at the same time the dinosaurs were killed off 65 million years ago. So 95% of the life on Earth was killed off in the last mass extinction, which was around 65 million years Chocolate ago. Chocolate dinosaur eggs. Chocolate dinosaur eggs. <laughs> That's for Easter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chocolate dinosaur Save eggs. Save that for Easter. So anyway, um, ammonite, unlike a Mennonite, an ammonite. 400 million years old, fossilized. And uh, the last time they were living was just before um, the big asteroid hit Earth and killed off the dinosaurs, killed off 95% of the planet, basically. Uh, the other thing that surprised me is that dinosaurs, although they didn't survive, if you leave the planet long enough, if you give it enough time, it grows dinosaurs. Because dinosaurs came back after three of the men. Now we're talking in some case, well, they were all hundreds of, well, they all hundreds of millions. It grows dinosaurs. No, no, I, I, that's a wrong way to put that. That's <laughs> hypothetical. It's Hypothetically. Like, instead of grass and trees, if it grows you, dinosaurs. If you have enough, if you give <laughs> the planet Earth long enough, what eventually evolves is reptilian like dinosaur creatures. 
Now, the first batch of them weren't as big as the second batch because the second batch got bigger. And my guess is that if they if they hadn't uh, been killed in the last mass extinction, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have made it that far because they would have dominated the planet. Literally, they. I think they want to see the pictures. Okay, let's show the pictures. Let's see. If you're going to tell stories, at least have pictures. At least have pictures it. to go along with it. So they didn't one. have any pins for our vests, so I got the T-shirt. Yeah, they didn't have any pins. All right, you ready? Start yeah. talking. You talk share now, so I don't have the, to share talk. the pictures. There is the picture. That is the museum. Toby did a drone flyover of the museum, and out front you can see two dinosaurs, and those are both dinosaur rep uh, statues uh, that represent two dinosaurs that were their skeletons were found in New Mexico. So these are New Mexican dinosaurs. And they were done by local artists, Triceratops Pent and Pentera Pent Oh no. Pentceratops. Pentera it has five horns instead of three. Yeah. Pentceratops or something like that. And uh, that one's called Spike. And I forget the other one. And that's in the blog. It's a T-Rex. <laughs> she wrote all of this open. in the blog. Open the blog so I can read it. So, um, uh, the the that's the second level that you need to start on. It's one of those. We didn't take any pictures out front because it was pretty cold that yeah. day, and there was like some snow still. Uh, so yeah, we didn't stay outside very long, except for later when Toby did this drone shot. But you can see the little people down there by the big dinosaur. Right there. How you can see how, how they are. How big they are. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. So that's the main parking lot. Uh, I've never seen it when it isn't pretty full. We did find a spot way down at the other end. And uh, this whole area here and here is handicapped only. And this is uh, for the bus drop-offs and pickups right, yeah, in, right in here. Like but school buses and if stuff. you go across the street, see where this, uh, this um, crosswalk is. If you go across the street, there's a much bigger parking lot here. You can't see it. I didn't put it in the picture. But Explora, which is the Children's Museum, is also across the street. So plenty of parking. This over here is the Museum of Albuquerque, and that's where they put up art and cultural exhibits. It's a really good museum. They always have really good there. shows there. Pardon? We've been there. Yeah, we have. More than once. Okay. So that's our uh, New Mexico Museum of Natural History. This is called the Bisty Beast. Um, the Bisty Beast is based on a, uh, a skull that they found in the wilderness not far from Farmington, New Mexico, which is near the Four Corners. And um, it is similar to a T-Rex, but it isn't a T-Rex. It's the same family of dinosaurs as a T-Rex, but it's called a Bisty something or other so that's why they call it the bisty beast and they named named it bella bella uh is a sculpture that was made based on the bones that they found um and they excavated and brought to the museum and in this was in the mid 80s that they found that and then um they built this designed and built this animatronic dinosaur in japan and then brought it in and put it together um, it was put together mm, a few years ago. It's only been there a couple of, I think 2018 is mm -hmm. when they put it yeah. in. Yeah, 2018. And she's full size. Uh, they had a contest to name her. And the, the Bisti comes from an area in uh, northwestern New Mexico called the Bisti Badlands. Oh, that's right. Uh, which is an area that is on tribal lands, but it is a uh, national monument. And it has these odd uh, sculptured rocks. Uh, that make and if you're there at the right time of the day, they make great photography. And they have a video on um, how they en encased the um, the fossil and um, then lifted it by helicopter. The National Guard assisted uh, with lifting it by helicopter and bringing it to the museum so it could be um, whatever they do. What do you call it? Excavated. It's well, the, the excavation, and then they bring it for processing yeah. because they wrap it in a plaster cast basically right. to protect it. Right. So, and, um, she always moves, you know, her arm, either her arms are like moving or her, she's blinking and she's just kind of, you know, doing like that. And then every hour and a half hour, she'll do like a little show where she's roaring and roar and roar and, the, the best show actually is to watch the kids 
that uh, that are watching her because she's loud enough and fierce enough. She opens her mouth and you can see her big teeth and makes the roaring sounds. Um, um, and it scares the little kids are, you know, it's one of those things it's where they thrilling. go to be scared. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of like Halloween, you know, it's right. thrilling. They know it's not real and mom and dad aren't scared. So right. it's obviously okay. But at the same time, it's a little scary. So yeah. they have fun with it. And as you can see, she's not as big as a T-Rex, but she's in the same family. That's us. We had to get our selfie like everybody else. There's actually a um, decal on the floor uh, in front of uh, Bella. And it says, if you're going to take your selfie, take it here. And then right. use this hashtag and, right. and yeah. at sign. And um, it's funny how you can see this person. Right? <laughs> yeah. But this Got is kind of where you start because this is the main atrium. And uh, we didn't exact, exactly know where to go from here. But if uh, if you look up behind up, yeah. up behind Bella, you'll see that area up there. And that's where the big flag says number one. So you would go upstairs and start there. Uh, so, but it's yeah. real natural. And <laughs> we weren't the only one. It's very natural <laughs> to walk right past Bella. And they have this mm. one uh, display. Uh, where they just have fossils of New Mexico. And it's kind of a collection of these things. And the, the nice thing about it is they show what they found and how they interpreted to complete the fossil. And it's very natural to walk right past her into this room. And suddenly you're uh, on the backwards trail, basically. Yeah. You just feel like, oh, well, uh, well, then we go to the next room. Then we go to the next room. So we uh, we did. We got, uh, we were we were backwards from the beginning. Although we went back and took the pictures. So here's the map. Go ahead. Yep. There's the map. Uh, we spoke with Tom, the docent, and he explained, uh, we had a conversation with him and he explained where, you know, we thought, oh, we, obviously you got to start on the first floor because it's number one. He's like, no, you're going to see number one up there. And then it kind of spirals around and you follow the numbers. And as you follow the numbers, you're going through the ages. So number one is origins, which is, uh, this is this is their permanent exhibit called Time Tracks Walk Through Time, begins on the second floor. If we had read the map and <laughs> thought about it, we probably, you know, would you get so excited when you're there? Oh, let's, oh, right. look, dinosaur. Oh, look over here. Oh, look over there. And you forget to look at the map and what it says until you're like lost and you're like, now what do we do? Um, and, and there's a sign, right? It says start yeah. walk through time right yeah. here. Yeah. And, and it's just this spiral that goes around through here. Uh, the planetarium is over here uh, and and the observatory is over which here. Which is where we ended. Right. Um, so it starts with origins, which is pre-Cambrian and Paleozoic. Then it moves into the dawn of the dinosaurs, which is Triassic. Then the age of the supergiants, which is Jurassic. And wow, uh, it's amazing. I was standing next to a dinosaur bone that was like two stories high. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, number four is New Mexico's seacoast, which is during the Cretaceous period. Which is a wonderful story about New Mexico being under the uh, um, Western Inland Sea. Yeah. And it, part of that is you're walking down a ramp and you're kind of spiraling again into the Cretaceous Sea exhibit. Um and then you're on the first floor. And number five takes you to the age of volcanoes. Number six is rise of the rise of the recent, which is the Cenozoic. It's um, the grasslands is what they also uh -huh. call it. And then you go into the cave exhibit, which is Pleistocene. And then eight is New Mexico's ice age, which is later Pleistocene. And yeah. and that puts us in the period about ten thousand years ago, where uh, some of the some of the larger beasts, the mammoths and the um, Camel. camels, were were <laughs> still here, and some of the first humans were here at the same time. So that's why I don't know if you guys know the story of it's uh, Clovis points. The the place that Clovis points were found was basically a mammoth uh, boneyard, and that's in New Me Clovis, New Mexico. That's why they call that. So yeah, you start at the top make the spiral out to four, come down the stairs or elevators. There's elevators, of course. And then you uh, start at uh, five and you go through six, seven, and eight. And then back uh, to the space and science exhibits. That's where they had the chocolate. There's also a great um, 
uh, geological display as well. They have great geology. Some of the specimens that they had were as good. They had a specimen of Smithsonite that was better than the ones I saw at the Mineral Museum. Yeah, I'm but sure. it was from the 20s. Yeah, yeah. And it had yeah. been had had been in New York and New Jersey for many years as well. So during the Ice Age, uh, Mary, uh, while the mountains did, you could tell the mountains were constantly covered in snow, uh, the grasslands weren't. So the, it, our, our, the people that were here at that time weren't dealing with the thick glaciers and things like that. It, it wasn't that, the, the Ice Age is a period uh, where the uh, where the earth was colder than normal. And as you went north, the, uh, the glaciers, I, I believe, didn't come any further south than uh, Minnesota, maybe North Dakota, that kind of thing. We didn't have glaciers down here, but we did have uh, cold. We had summer and winter. And the humans that were here were the lightly clothed humans as opposed to the ones that were always having to walk around in skins to survive. So we did have an ice age, but it wasn't your classic fighting the glaciers ice age. So here's where we started. It's called Emergence, a new, a new view of life's origin. And uh, it starts off with the L table of elements. Um, and then the DNA, how, how DNA is created in the first living being, living creatures. So the first living creatures were, uh, it was me. There's <laughs> living creature. There's one of our living creatures right there. So after the big bang, which was around 13 and a half billion years ago, by the time, uh, our galaxy solar system and planets were forming, that was four and a half billion years ago. So it took what is, um, can I do this guy? Nine billion years to get from the Big Bang to where we were starting to form um, galaxies, solar systems, and planets in those solar systems. And so it gets us there. So then there was this big wait from four and a half billion years ago to a half billion years ago. So it took the Earth from four and a half billion years to 500 million years before the first signs of life showed up. And it was the combination of the heat that was coming from the center of the earth and the water, because there was water on the planet at the time. And there were amino acids that were combining to form the first bacteria. Those were actually bacteria were the first uh, life on uh, the planet. And that took, like I said, from four and a half billion years ago, or 45, um, how do I want to say this? No, I'll say it that way. Four and a half billion years ago to a half billion years ago or 500 million years. So it was a long stretch of time before we first started seeing life. And that's what this, uh, that's what this is, um, the explanation. Now there is right here, you can see um, the meteor impact. Mm -hmm. Bombardment meteorite impact. Right. 4,400 to 4,000 million years. Right. So that's the 4.4 billion to 4 billion years ago that we were being bombarded by, um, by meteors that scientists suspect the combination of what was on that meteor, the explosion, the heat that was coming from the center of the earth and the water that was on the planet at the same time was actually the reason that life was being generated. Now, the second set of creatures, and they didn't come till another 100 million years later. So it took us 100 million years to evolve from bacteria to what living single-celled creatures. And the distinction between bacteria and living cell, single-celled creatures is those living single-celled creatures have DNA. And that's where we all started. Whether you're a monkey or a Toby, we all started with the same uh, living single cell creatures as they evolved. There's the display. And then this, I guess, is representative of like the blue algae. Yeah, exactly. In that. Because that, well, that's that where is we went. algae. Right. So we went from the living single cell creatures to algae, which are multi cell creatures in which the living cell creatures uh, thrived, the single cell creatures. And thrived. it produced the oxygen. Right, of, that was necessary the, for the earth. earth. Yeah. yeah. Moving into the dawn of the dinosaurs. So here's the important thing that, here's the thing that I thought was important. So the age of reptiles, they don't call them dinosaurs. This was the Triassic period from 251 million to 202 million years ago, which was the 
I want to say second mass extinction, but we'll come to that. Um, so they don't call it the age of dinosaurs. They call them the age of reptiles. And if you look at the exhibits in there, the, the drawings more than the skeletons, you can tell they're more reptilian than dinosaurian. I don't know how else to describe it. They're smaller. For they're, they're, they're smaller, but they're, they... They're more likely to swim or, or live near water. Right. And um, but what was interesting to me is that they grew in size, but they never got as big as the dinosaurs. And that's what I mean. If you leave Earth along, now this was uh, 50 million years it took to get from what was just beyond the, the single cell animals to these king sized reptiles. So I, I feel like if you leave Earth alone long enough, in this case, 50 million years, you end up with reptiles or dinosaurs or something. I'm, I'm not sure what causes it. So this is a sample uh, of one of the reptiles, not a dinosaur, a reptile, because we were still in the Triassic period. Tell them what that big... It's a sail. Yeah. Uh, they call it a sail. And I was like, well, that would make it like he could just lay in the water and then have the wind move him around. <laughs> but what was it used for? I don't know. I thought we had this conversation. No. It's used for cooling. So his blood, because it was a cold-blooded creature, um, his blood would travel through all this, and the skin would travel through this, and it would cool his, uh, it would keep his blood cool. And they built this uh, to house uh, the castings of the bones that they found, which, you know, they didn't find that many, but they had to extrapolate as to what the... Um, creature would have looked like from the bones that they found. And there are several exhibits that explain kind of what they started with and how they extract, Shelley said, as they extrapolated it out to come to the conclusion of what the skeleton looked like. And then once you have an idea of what the skeleton looked like, including the teeth, you could start imagining what the actual creature looked like, the actual, in this case, reptile uh, looked like. So I, it seems to me like a really wonderful job that challenges your imagination to like, I found this piece of bone. What does that look like in a skeleton? And then once you have the skeleton, what does that look like in an animal? This is from the quarry where they found coelophysis and they, this is an actual piece of that quarry with yeah, this uh, is not a cast with fossils, actual fossils in it. Of and, the and they have another uh, video that you can watch uh, that shows them receiving the the uh, uh, plaster cast that was holding this and how they cut it and started disassembling with it. And they decided that um, that there were already enough of these situations where scientists had already removed uh, the various uh, bone fragments, fossil fragments from the cast, from, I mean, from the, the dried mud, the fossilized earth. So they decided to leave this one intact. So that's what it is. It is not a uh, casting. It is the original one that was shipped to them from Ghost Ranch with coelophysis and you can, coelophysis, and you can see an example of him right here. Yeah. So. And what Tom was telling us was they had uh, brought the fossil in and um, the top was too much of a mishmash, and they just flipped it over. So this is the bottom, the bottom of it, yeah. of it, of the pile of um, dinosaurs that died in a big pile. Uh, they feel like it happened because of a flash flood uh, situation where it just swept all of them down into one spot. And that's me and Celo. Celophysis. We've gotten to feel like we know Celophysis because we met him when we were at Ghost Ranch and. Um, and they have him here in the museum. And again, he's not a dinosaur. He's a reptile. And these are two skeletons that they set up to look like they were going to fight. So. And, uh, <laughs> and it, we're talking about the Triassic period rather than the Jurassic period. So this is the age of reptiles. We're still in that age of reptiles rather than um, the age of the Jurassic age, the age of dinosaurs. And there were water creatures and we had enough water in New Mexico so that they could identify some of these creatures uh, 
as having been in, in New Mexico. And the other cool thing about it is every time they had one of these displays where they tried to explain to you the uh, creatures that you were looking at, they'd always have a map of New Mexico. And they would say, here's where we found these. It would show the areas in which they found um, those in New Mexico. And that's a lungfish. Ah, uh, so here's what's cool about a lungfish. He goes back, the lungfish goes back to the Triassic period. He was a water, uh, water fish. A water fish? A water, I mean, he's a, a, he was a water kind of reptile. He was a <laughs> water creature. Here's what's cool about him. The reason they call him a lungfish is because he doesn't have gills. He has lungs and you can see them bulging when he, when he breathes, you can see them right in here. I tried to get some video of it, but he kept running away from me. Dang nabbit. Uh, but he was one of the first creatures that was able to breathe air uh, above the water. He could stick his mouth above the water, fill his lungs and then go swimming again, which is why he's called a lungfish. Well, he survived several, as you can see, he survived all five of the mass extinctions but that feature, the ability to, uh, to take in and utilize air to flee, feed your bloodstream and, of course, the rest of your body, this was one of the creatures, one of the first creatures that had the ability to do that. And he survived. He survived all, uh, or not he particularly, but the uh, species survived the five major, the five mass extinctions and had the facilities necessary. So it was an animal like this, not a lungfish that had eventually grew legs and was able to crawl out of the sea and onto the land and explore the land. But he had to have those lungs because you can't breathe with gills out of the water. So uh, that's what makes him such an important uh, character in our line. Then we move into number three, age of supergiants. And you can see the skeletons, uh, the life-sized skeletons, reproductions of the big giant dinosaurs. These guys were huge. Yeah. I mean, you, this guy doesn't give it this this thing. You can see where the tail ends up here like that. And a, as you stand there, as you get progressively closer to it, you realize how huge this, uh, this uh, dinosaur was. And now we are in the age of this is the Jurassic uh, period. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, what they'd show you is a picture of what they started with. And what they start with is a couple of tail bones. And then they talk with other scientists who may have gotten other bones from other creatures in uh, other fossils in other locations. And, uh, and then they start building casts that once one of them has done it, they share it with all the others. And so that's how you can have so many of these fossils in so many different locations. Um, but this guy is just huge. I, I had to put good old wide angle lens on this to get this shot as I stood see his tail is up here, goes circles around there, goes all the way forward. And then, and then there's another, you, you can't see it in this context, but there's another one up here. So, um, cave, cave, uh, <laughs> miners, coal miners discovered, uh, Dinosaur footprints. These are T-Rex footprints they found in the ceiling as they were uh, mining for coal. And they were smart enough to stop right then and bring the paleontologists in so they could see it, the fossil hunters, as they call them, so that they could see them. And there's one over your head right there. And this uh, 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 is a cast, uh, but that's what it looked like when it was in the ceiling. So uh, uh, the, when you describe this, I would say that this was, so this is the footprint of a um, uh, T-Rex. And I would say it was about that big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was about a foot and a half across. It's pretty good size. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Probably belonged to a T-Rex. The presence of a dew claw indicates that it was a meat-eating dinosaur. It dates from the very end of the Cretaceous, and its size is what would be expected from a T-Rex. Since T-Rex was the only large predatory dinosaur from the end of the Cretaceous, it is assumed that a T-Rex left the track. The original fossil track was found on the Philmont Scout Ranch in northeastern New Mexico. Two stories about that. One is there were some people that thought the Fen treasure was on the film on Scout Ranch. The second story is that my grandfather donated part of the land that went into the, uh, from his land, 
he donated part of the land that went into this Philmont's uh, Scout Ranch. I thought this was the most fun. This is New Mexico seacoast because you walk down into our ocean and it explains how. Um, you how, actually kind of go up. Is this a down ramp or an up? That's ramp? a down ramp. Okay. You, oh, you came, we came out from the dinosaurs and you can see the Big Bang or whatever. The, no, the asteroid. Asteroid. Mural on the side there. So by this time, by the time New Mexico uh, is a, um, uh, a sea in the inland, the Western Inland Sea, by that time, the asteroid of 65 million years ago had struck the Earth and killed off all the dinosaurs. So we're going up the ramp. And some of these crocodilians, you can actually see there down are the some of these fossils. We're going down this ramp. So we're going to make a turn. Yeah, but then it goes no, it's going no, up. No, no, you're right. It goes you're, up. This one is up. Yeah. That's why it's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you could look down on this. Yeah. And there's a dinosaur with her eggs. Protecting her eggs. And I included this picture even though it's not a super good one because of the reflection because if you hit the button um it makes a sound and you're like what is the sound about well the parasaurophus parasaur parasaurophus yeah crest. something like that has a crest or a horn on top of its head which is hollow and they uh they did ct scans of it they figured it out and that it they could have made this trumpeting sound uh, from their crest, you know, like animals do to attract or call to each other. And so people kept hitting the button and you know, rap, 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 rap. so I'm like, we could hear it all over the museum. I'm like, something's happening. What's going on? Yeah, What's we, happening? It took us a half hour I thought, to track you know, the sound. Just down. like the Beastie Beast would go off every half hour and have her, little party i thought something else was a big show but the, all this was was showing you this horn and how it probably made this sound <laughs> and you can see that you can see us do that in the video as well yeah and that is um they had like a upper deck that you could oh no see it, it is so around. you'd come around here from the second floor yeah you'd go down this ramp down and this ramp down. and then one more down to here see that hallway there that's where that leads. Oh, yeah. See, it's very spirally, so it can get yeah. kind of confusing sometimes. So these are some of the plants. It was a very, it was very tropical in New Mexico at, at uh, that time. You, these were plants. These tropical-style plants were in New Mexico at that time uh, that they were uh, underwater. And I ha we have an application called Rocked, R-O-C-K-D. And uh, it helps you determine... Uh, if you're at a location and you want to understand the geology of that location, uh, what it what the geology is, but you can also take it back. So you can go back literally back four and a half million years to draw this back. Well, I did did that for the fun of it when I was standing. It, it does it based on your current location. So I was in my backyard in Bernalillo and I started taking it back. If I had lived during this period, my house would be a... Um, Beachfront property. Beach, beachfront property at, at the New Mexico on the on the western uh, interior seaway. And this is what you can see from when you're on the deck at the top, and the floor is, uh, you know, kind of looks like resembles water, so that you can understand that this is an animal that would have lived under the water. Um, and then they have that little alcove there, full of uh, underwater creatures um, and paintings on the wall that represent that as well. And then some shells and fossils over here and there were seabirds this is an accurate representation there were seabirds there were things that looked like seals and over here you'll see an ammonite uh not just the shell that with a fossilized shell there were creatures that lived inside of that ammonite and some of them grew to be 25 feet across so this guy it was just a baby had big brothers and sisters that were 25 feet across that. Uh, and, and again, since they had been around for 400 million years, they, um, they were growing and then, and then they were all lost with the uh, fifth mass extinction. So what we learned 
from the museum about the dinosaurs was they would continue to grow their entire lives. Some of those uh, giant dinosaurs that we saw in the age of giants, they figured they were somewhere between 100 and 200 years old. And in, like tortoises, they continue to grow uh, f their whole lives. They never stopped growing. So that's how they got to be so very so big. big. Yeah. yeah. Cretaceous, New Mexico, Seacoast. There's a little anemone friend. Uh, I'm in mean, ammonite, ammonite friend. Shells. They had a shell exhibit. Tell them about the Evelator. So the Evelator <laughs> is, is a place where it looks like you're going into a large elevator, um, but you're actually, it's about evolution, right? So it's taking you on a ride which is not really, it's kind of like a Disneyland thing where it just feels like you're riding, but you're not going anywhere. So you go in and there's a video and Charlie is your pilot and he's talk, talking you through it. And, and uh, he keeps making these stops along the way for taking you further and further back in time. And at the very end, they open the doors and you're walking out into that undersea world with uh -huh. the, you know, the Cretaceous which is about the, the 75 million years ago. So you started 37 million years ago and at, at the elevator and there's images and uh, Charlie, our little uh, pilot will get out and you see him getting out it's and chasing us. Yeah. Him. It's all yeah. videos of him getting, it's very cool. Yeah. It's an, it's, it's nicely done. I really liked it. It would have been better if the little kid had just not talked. <laughs> yeah. It was, <laughs> bunch of jabbery kids. We got there. a video there. You'll see that in the video. And you see on the side, it looks like they make it look like, you know, the rocks are going by as you're going down and down and down. So I thought that was really interesting. That was very cool. Yeah. They did a cool job. Well done. And this is where you come out. You can see the evolator that's, doors there. That's the, the outside. Exit. And this is one of the creatures that lived in the, see, it was uh, not only reptilian, but it was a meat eater. So if it saw one of these seal-like animals, it was definitely dinner. I'm not sure why I took this shot. It was this little blue fish that wouldn't hold still. Because they had aquariums every now uh, and then, so they were cool. It was like a shiny little fish. So Then we moved into the volcanoes. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. Uh, by the way, the, um, the fish like the seas populated themselves with first fish, first the invertebrates and then the vertebrates. And they were 253 million years ago. So they've survived a lot of this stuff. Mm. Fishies. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is, so uh, at the bottom of this, it starts talking about the uh, impact of the asteroid and how it killed off the dinosaurs and the damage that it did. And, um, what effects it had on the rest of the planet. And the reason they refer to it is that Chicxulub. Chibshulub. 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 Chib. Chib. Shulub. Chib. I don't see any B in there. That's what they got for the pronunciation. Chib. C H I B. Well, that Chibshulub. Unless it's a double S like in German. Make it like a B when it's already it's a, a double S. It's right off Yucatan. It's a little town in Yucatan, uh, off Yucatan, Mexico, uh, that they named the crater after. And it was found by a couple of guys who actually worked for um, a oil company. And uh, scientists knew that there might have been uh, an asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs, but they weren't sure, they couldn't find the crater. And these guys looking for oil, they were two geologists working for an oil company, and they found it. And the other thing that you'll notice is something called the KT boundary. This one is in, this is a picture of it in Raton, New Mexico. The KT boundary is, stands for Cretaceous Triassic. The K, the reason they uh, call it K is because it was named by a German. And Cretaceous in German has, starts with a K rather than a C. Uh, but you can see this boundary, which is a thin line of brown earth in the side of uh, mountains. Uh, they're very prominent in places like Italy, any place where there's mountains. Well, we have it in New Mexico. We have a KT boundary line in New Mexico. It's this one right there. And that was all the stuff. Now, it accumulated over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. But it was all the stuff that accumulated after the impact. 
And if you look at rocks, and this is how geologists do it, if you look at rocks below fossils uh, or rocks below the KT impact, it is filled with life. If you look at it above, it is not. But it was also an analysis of that. We didn't go on. It was also an analysis of that. And you'll hear me talk about this in the video. It's an analysis of that KT um, impact uh, that was done by a, a father and son, neither of whom was a was a um, archaeologist. I think they were geologists, but they wondered, you know, how do we decide this is an asteroid? And what they discovered is they took some of the uh, some of the earth in this small strip of the KT boundary. And they started analyzing it, and they discovered that it had high levels of iridium. Now, you can find iridium, I was wrong, uh, you can find iridium on the planet Earth, but you could never find it in the amounts that was in the KT boundary. You could only find that in objects that were in space. And that's how they concluded that it was an asteroid strike. And then right after that, they found, uh, right, right after that, they found the crater. So there's still controversy about that. That is not one of those things that is without controversy or discussion. Maybe I shouldn't call it controversy. There, there are still scientists out there that will argue whether or not it was actually the, um, the uh, asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs. So the next and uh, second to last one is called the Land of Volcanoes. Not the second to last one. It's not the second. That's no, no. Third? I'd have to look at the map. Tell us about Land of Volcanoes. Land of Volcanoes. Uh, you, so you go through what is sort of a cave spiral. And down below, you have the transparent floor panels that show you the, the lava flowing beneath your feet. It's just lighting, of course, but simulated lava flows. And then at the same time, you're hearing the booming, like the volcano exploding. And then it takes you through... Uh, it shows you some information about volcanoes and the time of the volcanoes and how it affected the land and, you know, it caused the land to move apart and, and, you know, change the climate and it killed off certain species. And then it moves you into some of the minerals that were produced by the uh, volcanoes. We're very fortunate in New Mexico uh, to have what is referred to as the Rio Grande Rift. Uh, and it pretty much goes down the center part of New Mexico. It right widens as you go further south. But the western side of that rift is completely created by volcanoes. And any place on the western side you go, you're going to find basalt. You're going to find volcano, residual volcano stuff all along the western side. The eastern side of the rift, as the rift was created, it pushed it up to the east, and that's created by um, tectonic action, not great tectonic action, but it goes down the middle of New Mexico. It's where the Rio Grande River runs, and uh, on one side is real basalty, and the other side is real geologic with everything else but basalt. It's very cool. We're very fortunate to have it. Geolo geologists love New Mexico because we, we're so geologically diverse. Now we move into number six, which is evolving grasslands. And we see a whole bunch of new species evolving. Um, as you can kind of see, they went from this stripy fish, then it came out of the water and it turned into kind of a deer looking thing and then evolved into a horse. Yeah. And that's because after the ice receded, uh, so there's this wonderful story about how grass, just kind of showed up and scientists can't explain why it showed up, but once it showed up, it covered the entire part of the West uh, with it. And that grass became the source of nutrition for a lot of different species. And so they grew uh, evolutionarily speaking. So you turned from this animal here that had come out of the water. Let me go back here. So you can see at one point it was a fish onto the land uh, and then it became a four-legged creature, but because of evolution, it got stronger and faster, et cetera, et cetera. 
and uh, eventually became a horse. So people, so Native Americans didn't have horses. The first horses that Native Amer Americans saw, we had this conversation in the museum, were the horses that the Spanish brought with them. There were horses in North America before that, but they didn't survive. They didn't, uh, they, they didn't make it beyond uh, this period by the time the Native Americans were populating the Southwest. This is a giant bird. What do you mean by giant? Explain that. I don't know. Uh, it's as big as a person. Yeah, if not bigger. He was about the size of the rock. He was a pretty good sized bird. And he had that beak that you thought to yourself, well, if that guy ever wanted to take my arm with him, he could probably do that. Yeah. And he was, and apparently he was fast to boot. So there you go. He was called the dia diatrima. And he was one of the largest land dwelling birds that ever lived. Found in Cuba, New Mexico. We do have so a Cuba. kind of like a, I don't know, a parrot, but it's got a parrot, giant but, parrot. Yeah, yeah, with those big beaks. Relative named uh, Gastornis are found in slight older, slightly older rocks in the in Europe. Number seven is cave. So, so we went through another cave experience. Do you remember the difference between stalactites and stalagmites? Stalactite comes from the ceiling because it holds on tight. Uh huh. And stalagmites, and stalagmites might might want to grow up to be touch the yeah. stalactite. And then uh, the Mexico's ice age with the wild cats and the giraffe, not the giraffe, the camels Camel. and the elephants. Well, so the mammoths. Uh, I've always heard these called the saber toothed tigers. Yeah, they're not. They're called saber saber tooth cats. Yeah. And boy, that was pretty saber tooth. Because it's where we get mountain lions from. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're in the mountains. But again, you don't r realize where well, the image doesn't do it justice in the sense that you don't realize how big these things were until you're standing under them. And that was, I would say, that was the size of a horse. That's how big that animal was. And Yeah. These teeth are the size of your hand. Yeah. Easily. So those are the dire wolves. So you can see. Oh, yeah, dire wolves. Yeah. So this was uh, the uh, beginning of the end of the Ice Age. And so we were getting our grasslands. We were getting our water lands. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if this is an artist impression of the Rio Grande Rift at the time because we're, the, the Rio Grande Rift has mountains on both sides, one from volcanoes and one from uh, tectonic action. And this was the equivalent of the early wolf. Uh, and again, huge size. They were big. They didn't have anything to keep them from growing. Mm -hmm. So these were the last of the hunted animals, the large, uh, they had a name for them. Uh, the, the. Camelope? Oh. Camelops. I don't know what you're talking about. They had us, they, they, they called them a name. They, cla they grouped them in a name mm -hmm. of large animals. Mm -hmm. So... But you can see that uh, mastodon, that's not an elephant, that's a mastodon. And they also had one huge... One of them's a mastodon, one's a mammoth, I think. Is this, this is the mammoth, that's the mastodon. They had the different... Head shapes. Head shapes, yeah. yeah. They're slowly talking to the... I'm mammoth. reading the sign about the head oh, okay. shapes. I thought you were <laughs> And that was the end of the walk through time. And this was an exhibit about an earthquake and you could jump up and down on the floor and make the the lines seismograph. go across. It had yeah, a seismograph, seismograph that was working. So it was fun. And there's the chocolate exhibit. We went into that. Uh, before you get to the chocolate exhibit, they had an exhibit of meteorites and meteor. Let me see if I get that picture. I no, get, I didn't put it in there. Okay. Meteorites. So they had meteorites and meteor wrongs. Things that weren't meteorites. And yeah, the things like that weren't uh, meteorites. And they tell you where they're from. Those are from Africa, except for the first one, which is from Kansas. And then we had an exhibit on the planets, and then kind of give you a nice idea of you know how big each planet is compared to the other ones. So all the gas, the four outer gaseous planets, are, of course, are bigger, uh, and they had size comparisons, but they didn't have size distance. Size distances. Right. They had a map of New Mexico to scale for scale. And they said, this is what it would look like if you tried to make the distance from it. There were, of course, off the map. Thanks. There's ingenuity. 
a helicopter. And they had a little video of uh, what the rover took video of this guy flying yeah, across very Mars. Cool. Mary say. Yeah, we're going to get to them in just a minute. So this is um, the newest one. Um, I want to say rover. It's not rover. It's um, persistence. Persistence. No, perseverance. Perseverance. And uh, <laughs> you don't realize how big it is until you're standing next to it. It's the size of a small car. I mean, it's just huge. So you can imagine what it took to get it there with all the technology that it has to continue researching uh, what's going on uh, Mars. So this is, that's, panels. that's, pardon me. And it's got solar panels. Well, this is Rover. Yeah. So this is Ingenuity and this was Rover. This was the first one. So, but they do have the solar panels on them because that's other energy. Smithsonite. Did I get more than one picture of that? Of what, Smithsonite? So Smithsonite is that uh, very uh, specifically uh, New Mexican. Uh, you get in the Kelly mine. This was one hell of a large specimen. I mm -hmm. mean, it was just huge. Well, it says they kind of named, uh, this was found in, what does it say? Named first James Smithson. Removed in the 1920s. And then it went. Uh, From the Kelly mine. It was, yeah. And it was in a New York uh, museum. And then it was displayed in the Morris Museum in New Jersey. And then in 1989, became the first specimen uh, to be in the mineral collection at this museum in New Mexico. So the return of this Smithsonian specimen to New Mexico is appropriate because some people want it to become New Mexico's official state mineral. I think uh, we already have an official. We state have mineral. an official. It's state in the mineral. next picture. <laughs> There's our official. Now you Good can't. The, the lighting doesn't do it justice, but this is actually a um, a specimen that includes several subspecimens of turquoise. All the lighter color is uh, turquoise. If you were a turquoise miner, this would be worth a lot of money to you. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of cool to be able to just touch the Smithsonian. and I go, mm -hmm. oh, this is it. And because we well, know how expensive those, um, those samples, samples were are the specimens. in the mineral museum that you could purchase. And so to see this one and be able to touch it was really cool. And none of them. So one of the characteristics of a good specimen of Smithsonite is this bubbly look that it has. And it's rare that you get a, a purchasable Smithson, uh, Smithsonite specimen that has this look. And if you do, it's from five hundred to a thousand dollars, and it's and it's going to fit in your hand, or smaller, so, or or smaller. Yeah. yeah. But this one was the size of what do you think? I would say a tire, like a wheel on a car, if you laid it down. Well, let's say, yeah, it was like or a big laundry basket. Oh yeah, that's a good one. A yeah. big laundry basket. Uh, because it, it was big enough that Toby and I could put both of our hands on and the not top get of it, it right. and still not go all the way. Right. And there. the other thing too, is it, it isn't just a big specimen. It's a perfect specimen of Smithsonite. You could, I've never seen a better one than that. I had the hard thing is, do you want to, do you want to kick turquoise out of, uh, out of no. uh, New Mexico's mineral? No. That would be hard. I don't know if you could get turquoise, anybody. They, they were mining turquoise. Uh, back with the Pe Puebloans, and right? They, they found Smithsonite like in the twenties. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is part of their uh, mineral display. They have three of these cases. It was a pretty good example. And again, it's all New Mexican. There's another sample of the Smithsonite. One of them up here or over on this side was turquoise, but it had all the major. Had a pretty good size sample or specimen of uh, pyrite. But that's mm. right there is the pyrite. Mm -hmm. There's the, the other uh, specimen of turquoise. Copper and turquoise. Copper yeah. and turquoise. Well, turquoise is the primary mineral in turquoise is copper. Mm -hmm. It starts with CU. Chocolate. Yum. Chocolate exhibit. And they had the rainforest sounds and music going on. It's a very cool exhibit. Um, yeah. So... Do we show? Yeah, I think we show. So one. this is the seed pod, but they're I big. Think, they're like yeah. a melon, you know, like a small watermelon. 
and they grow on a tree. And this is the inside. Um, and what happens is animals like monkeys or whatever is in the area will break them open and eat the pulp. pulp, but they'll spit out seeds because seeds are very bitter, as most of you know, if you've ever tried baker's Wrong. chocolate, baker's chocolate yeah. <laughs> it's pretty nasty so they spit out the seeds and then the seeds go back you know into the ground and it grows more trees um so that's how that works but the the central american natives found a way to process it uh to sweeten it up and that's why it became a uh, it literally became hot chocolate was a thing oh, yeah. and they used it in religious ceremonies and they used it for money uh so to buy an avocado would cost you three cocoa beans. Uh, to buy a turkey egg would cost you one or three, three cocoa yeah. seeds, uh, cacao seeds, however you want to say it. Tomato would cost you one, green, green five green chilies, uh, or tamale. You know, I guess tamales were made way back when when With they were leaves. using. Yeah, yeah, because you had chocolate corn. for money. <laughs> you had corn and you had meat, right? Uh, so, so if you've got the corn, corn with the meat matate. and you've got a husk, you can make yourself a tamale. Well, you got to have some lard or fat to hold it together. Yeah. 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 Oh, last picture. That was the last one. Yep. All right. Well, um, we didn't go to the planetarium or the, uh, the movie theater that's in there they have uh several films throughout the day that you can uh, watch we didn't do that uh because you can't really take your camera in there and show people what's going on um it is an extra charge so if you go to the museum and you want to see one of the films uh you should plan for that and purchase the ticket uh when you get there and when you're at the front desk because that's where you have to buy the tickets anyway if you're in new mexico and you're a veteran um, I don't know if you have to be disabled. I think you have to be disabled. If you're a disabled veteran, you get a pass to this museum uh, and and several others as well. We, yeah. We we had it in the video, and we just I decided not to leave it in, but uh, you can get a New Mexico pass. If you go to their website, uh, there's a lot more information about uh, prices and uh, passes that you can get for. You can go to a like there's a family pass that you can buy to continue to go to the museum for a year. You can buy a pass of uh, that you can go to several different museums on one pass with your family. They also have something uh, if you're a resident and you have a library uh, that you ha that you're a member of your library, you can go to the library and check out a pass so that you can go to these museums for free. So those people who are unable to afford to go, uh, can go to their library, get a pass for their family, take their family for the day. Um, so that's really so cool. regular pass is eight So they bucks. try to make it really uh, accessible and available to everybody. There's a lot of school field trips that go there. Um, I don't remember if, I think my kids probably went there mm -hmm. on a field trip. So uh, regular day pass is eight bucks. Senior is seven. Disabled veteran is free. Children are four you know, four bucks. Uh, if you're going to do the movies, they, they have movies, all different movies throughout the day. So the first one shows at 11 and the last one shows at three. So you could go in at 11 and just pop from movies to movie to movie. Now each movie will cost you an extra two bucks uh, to see and then finish up in the planetarium and the observatory. So it's pretty cool. Let's see. Do we have some questions? John says, I thought they called themselves lattes. <laughs> Mary says chocolate dinosaur eggs. We did. They're called copper light. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> we did have an ice age, Mary, but it wasn't as dramatic as the ice age that experienced for the north. Mary Green says, I remember when I learned that people and mastodons lived at the same time. Those folks were tough and smart. Yeah. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it was the um, studies that were done as a result of the discovery of the Clovis point and the Folsom points. Uh, because it was po those points that were found uh, along with uh, mass mastodon deaths. Yeah, and when we were at the museum, the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, we, you know, were reading about the people who are ancestors, right? And how 
they were so strong and muscular and they had to be right to be able to just live and, and feed themselves and, and hunt animals and gather and all of the things that they had to do, uh, work with their, you know, primitive tools, everything. And so they were very strong people. And even then the average lifespan was 30 years. So we've made, uh, well, we haven't made as much progress in being able to sustain ourselves because but our lifespan is significantly longer than the lifespan that they experienced. There were no 70-year-old Neanderthals walking there. There weren't earth. any fat ones either. There weren't any fat. <laughs> had yeah. to work hard to eat. Yeah. You know, it, we were at the, uh, when we were in um, Los Alamos, they had several videos of people in the 40s and there were different kinds. So there were the scientists. And then there were the workers that were helping to construct uh, that whole uh, scientific facility up there. Then there were the military up there. Then there were the wives of the people that were living there. And I was sitting there and there wasn't one, for lack of a better word, I, I'm sure I could use more polite words. There wasn't one fat person amongst them. There were none of, they were all slim built to, in some cases, I think to myself, I, I can see that guy's ribs. But there were no fat people in the 1940s. Well, you had to remember there was a war effort going on. So a lot of things were rationed. Well, even then, I, I there are fat people that I know managed to stay fat even when you ration them. <laughs> well, that's because Perhaps of the I'm food one of them. that we I shouldn't have talk. nowadays. I should, there's, that's me we calling don't have that. as many I shouldn't be talking food about choices. The, Oh, we the have too black. much processed food in yeah, our lives. That's, That's our problem. <laughs> that is our problem. It just amazed me at how there literally was not one, you know, in all those. Well, you know, General white. Groves kind of was getting a little hefty. He was a little end. bit hefty. <laughs> yeah, he was a little bit spoiled. But yeah. Oppenheimer, considering he drank and smoked and partied the way he did, you'd think. But he was skin and bones. Yeah. So. All right. All right, so let me remind you again. Oh, I closed that window. I didn't mean to do that. Let me remind you again, if you want to see the entire movie, uh, it... Uh, video. Uh, video, I'm sorry. It premiered at <laughs> 7 o'clock. It's uh, one hour and five minutes long, and it's basically and our it's tour. our New Mexico Day Trips YouTube tour. Channel. You'll see uh, Bella doing her sounds. You'll hear doing the... Her dinosaur dance. Parapet of a, a horned dinosaur making noises, because we recorded that. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we had a good definitely time. a good thing to do if you're in Albuquerque and you have an extra day to spare to kill to whatever and the weather, especially if the weather's not very good. It's a great indoor activity. Uh, it's great for families, kids, adults. It's very interesting and you could definitely spend a day in there. So they do have a coat room where you can check your coats and they do have a um not a cafeteria, a small restaurant, but both of those were closed. And I don't know whether it's pandemic related and they just haven't reopened. They were redoing the restaurant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what they had the sign. Up but they, said. but the, I, I was there several years ago with the boys and they had a cloak room and they had lockers. And uh, I noticed that we went in, and they were all closed and I, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't make any difference to me. Uh, so I didn't ask why, but um Maybe by the time you guys get there, they'll. So there's have a those. lot to see in the video that we didn't show you in the in the pictures because yeah. there is a lot to see in this museum. So make sure you check it out. Uh, the, there's one room that we went into that had all these terrariums and aquariums and, and live animals and things in there. Um, really, really cool. You you got into a conversation. I was walking down the hallway, but because I had the microphone, and you were looking at something. I I can't remember what you were looking at, and you had a conversation. Some kind of large insect. Yeah, and this guy came up and explained that. You know, that I thought she it was, was hiding in the. Yeah, yeah, it was very cool. All right, so yeah, go watch the video and go to the photo album because you saw probably fifty or sixty of the two hundred and sixty that we we posted in the photo album. So there's lot lots more there. Okay. Yep. All right. And um, make sure you read the blog because there's a lot of additional information in there and uh, additional information just uh, specifically about this museum when it's open, um, their website and all of that. So check that out on our website. All right. Thanks for joining us uh, tonight, guys. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoy this trip. We've got a longer trip planned. We're going to be gone the entire weekend. We're going to be going to the uh, National... Space Museum uh -huh. in Alamogordo. 
uh, and we're going to a gem show, a gem, gem and mineral show in Las Cruces over the weekend. So we're doing a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three different day trips. So you'll be seeing the, those videos over the next three Over the next three, three weeks. weeks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the last place? What's that place that I keep forgetting? Dripping Springs. Dripping Springs. It's a big old tall waterfall on BLM land, which means we can get some drone footage. So, yep. Looking forward to that. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. We love you.